man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. It's all about you. All your glory and your fame It's not about me As if you should do things my way You alone are God And I surrender To your
give the Lord a mighty help of praise. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Tell him, God, I thank you for loving me. Clap for him for his faithfulness. Clap for him for his mercy. Clap for him for his goodness. Clap for him for his forgiveness. Oh, we love you. Come on, give him a love hand clap. Ah, hallelujah. Thank you, choir. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor on your left. Turn to your neighbor on the right and tell them, Banangi, how are you today? How was your night? How did you sleep? Mm, ask them, how was your weekend? What are you doing these days? Do you have a job? Oh, I pray for you. Are you married yet or we wait on God? Gavuze, takutisa, takutisa. Hallelujah, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Isn't God good? Isn't he faithful? He's faithful. Hallelujah. Even me, I slept well. I'm happy. Yeah. Praise God. I thank God for the strength to stand before you every Sunday, every Thursday. Hallelujah. So, I need to tell you in advance today, our service might be a bit longer. Okay? Because we have a lot to cover in a very short what? Time. But believe me, you will not want me to finish. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me, let me pray for your offering right now. Father, I thank you for the most generous people in the world. Amaze them, establish them, work in them, through them, and for them. I believe to hear great testimonies touching their lives and their story. I believe that you're increasing them every day. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed and believed. And all saints said, Amen. Glory to God. How many of you have come here for the first time? Now, your first time you've come to church. Okay, in Fanero. You see, I, I even booked your chair in advance. That means from today, that is your chair. If you find somebody in it, you tell them, that woman in your ears. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So anyway, recently, like I told you at the beginning of the year, the Lord had impressed on my heart. This year, I list every month to give you a dose on marriage and parenthood. Do you remember? <laughs> Marriage and what? Parenthood. So you're going to have one today because they, we've come to the end of month. Praise the Lord. Now, this is important for several reasons. One, for now Uganda, it is said that more than 70% of the population in Uganda is below the age 35. We're the second youngest population in the world after Niger. That means, consequently, that we have more people right now in the process either of getting married or who are freshly married. Very few people in this room can say we've been married for 10 years. Very few. You see, those of you who are married, you're two, three, four, five, six, ten, like Pastor Zach and the rest. A few of us, like me and my wife, 70 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are few. Praise the Lord Jesus. And we're still counting. We're still counting. It has just begun. Praise the Lord. So, that's number one. Number two also, it is so appalling, those of you who see or read what's happening in the world, it's so appalling, the divorce rates in the world. People are separating at a speed that we're able to count or than human history before. You know? So it's important to deal with our people early. Some of the things I'm going to tell your children, some of you might not have been able to tell them. And I see some young teenagers, 19, 20, 17, you're learning something today that one day you will need to use when you're ready to what? To settle. Number three, we have read statistics and I've read them for you. Highest crime rates in the world are from children from dysfunctional families. 
highest school dropouts in the world are from children from dysfunctional families. Substance and drug abuse are children from dysfunctional families, highest number. Highest rape cases in the world are from children from uh, dysfunctional families. Highest criminal cases in the world are from children from dysfunctional families. So we realize that the problem with family is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm not saying that children from functional families don't get these challenges, but I'm only saying that children from dysfunctional families are at higher risk of these predicaments. Are you following? So it's a very important thing. And I told us, some of you who were here last week when I was teaching, that the four fundamental things that really justify a well-positioned ministry in God, in God, okay? And I told you one of them was salvation. We want to see the salvation of people in the church. Number two, we want to see transformation. When you sit under the right teaching, something in you must change. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And number three, we must see physical progress. Things that add on you. Physically, you get married and whatever. But financially, you get a job, you get a good career. All of that is part of the, of the blessing of God. As a ministry, we are growing. Individually, you're growing. Some of you came to this ministry with nothing, and I see how much God has given you, and I'm, my joy is dropping. Praise the Lord. Uh, there's somebody I picked in university. They were putting on the shortest cuts I know. Yesterday, they were at a meeting and lame people were walking. And I see that. And I'm like, hmm, that is transformation. But lastly, also, I've emphasized family is an important aspect. We must have strong what? Families. Praise the Lord. We must be strong on family. Those are the fundamentals. That's the fruit. Leave along these things people say. Yeah, I suspect him. She has a snake. Hey, those, that's nonsense. That's don't even ever sit in, under such silly conversations. Some people talk like they never went to school. You understand? Not that they don't understand God. Praise the Lord. Those are fruit. Fruit. You want to see people saved. That's important. Because every soul that gets saved is going to heaven. That is fruit. You know men by their fruit. Praise the Lord. We know men by their fruit. That's very important for us to know. Not these other things people speak. I suspect Ismaya, the reason why people are healing him, Ismaya, he has a snake in his shoe. Some people are sick. How can, they, how can somebody walk with a snake in his shoe? How can a snake in a shoe heal cancer? You understand? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, we are going to learn so much about marriage this year than ever before. Praise the Lord. And it's deliberate. It's deliberate. It's the liberate. So there was a portion of scripture that I, told, I, I remember I promised you uh, to teach about, but I'd not given it time enough, invested enough time for, to, to, to deal with it because I'd not had the platform to. But today I have the what? The platform. So you're going to learn about marriage today. Either if it's not going to help you, it will help somebody one day because you will help them. You see, that's the mystery. It, this might not be helpful to some of you because I'm here, it's late, I messed up, I don't, you know. But for some of you, it's going to give you a second chance. Yes. For some of you, it's going to heal the broken places in your marriage. And for some of you, it's saving you from grave mistakes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So the conversation begins from the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus Christ is talking with his disciples confirming marriage and divorcement. And then Jesus says a very fundamental statement and said, it was never the will of God for people to be what? Divorced. But he said Moses, when Moses saw the hardness of the hearts of people, he said, okay, if because your hearts are hard, I can allow you to put away your wives or your husbands because you're hardened hearts. But if your hearts were not hardened, you were not supposed to put away your what? Your spouse. Except on uh, the charges of adultery. For those of you who are hardening your heart, okay, 
if you catch them in adultery, divorce them. But just because your heart is hard, not because it's the will of God for you to divorce somebody because they cheated on you. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. And then when Jesus goes on explaining, he's talking to his disciples, they start to feel like, eh, <laughs> if, if nobody was supposed to come out of this, then we are trapped. That is why when you read verses 10, the message version, the Bible says, Jesus' disciples objected and said, if those are the terms of marriage, we are what? Were those happy men? Eh? If, there were, if there was any married among them, were they happily married? Why would a man use the statement stark? Meaning that some of the challenges you see today in marriage have happened before. Your case is not new. It's just new to you. But your case is not one. So somebody started getting what? Stuck. And some even started to say, why do we even marry in the first place? You see, I think they'd seen the troubles that come with marriage. They'd seen the challenges that sometimes come with getting married. And they said, ah. In fact, like one man said, those who are out of it are struggling to enter it. Those who are in it are trying to run out of it. Not all. Let me correct you. Not all. Some of us, we are happy. Hallelujah. We are what? We are happy. It's the best thing that has ever happened to us, some of us. So when you're talking about your issues, discuss them from your context. Don't carry your challenges and bring them. Ah, oh, women. Ah, mine is okay. Praise the Lord. You discuss yours. If they're disturbing you, they're disturbing you. That's not my challenge. You understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. So, Verses 12, this is where, verses 11, sorry, this is where uh, I, I want to go. They said, why are we getting married? So Jesus said, he gives this fundamental statement and says, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. Yeah? Not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. He did not say not everyone is mature enough to get married. Hmm? He said, not everyone is mature to live. So, no, no. You can get married. But living, staying married, you require a certain what? Maturity. He says it requires a certain aptitude and grace. Aptitude is a certain inner ability. There's a work God has to do inside your heart to mature enough to handle a wife or a husband. And grace and a certain grace of God operating in and on your life. Not everyone is for marriage. He says marriage isn't for everyone. Marriage isn't for everyone. Marriage isn't for everyone. Because there's a lot God will do and has to do inside you. And some of it is going to be a hard lesson. It's not going to be the smooth, swift roses and eh, whatever. It's, it's a hard thing to allow God to do in you, yet a very easy thing when you understand who God is. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, he says, not everyone will walk there because of what has to be done in you first and the grace that you require. So, marriage is a grace. Living a married life is a grace. And these are some of the things that we need to share with you to help us understand. Because fundamentally, the question and reason of this service today, the question is, are you ready for marriage? Or, when you entered marriage, were you ready? Or, where you're at now in your marriage? Are you mature enough to live in that marriage? Or, there are things that are missing. And some of those things, God is going to start ministering to us. So the question fundamentally tonight is, are you ready for marriage? Or did you enter marriage ready? Because I know people who are 10 years in marriage, but they were not ready. They're not ready. They're 20 years in marriage, but they're not ready to leave it. It's just there by God's grace. They're 30 years in marriage, but they can pull the plug any time. They are 40 years in marriage, but they can pull the plug anytime. One time I was in, I don't remember, it was one of those states in the, United, in the US, and I'd gone to preach, and I find this lady, she's, uh, I think, in her 70s, and her husband has filed for divorce. 
Can you ask, you guys are already going to die. Couldn't he be patient <laughs> for the last for few years? Because one, the guy was older. Two, this woman is actually sick. She has cancer, she has all things. I, I doubt she's still alive. So I'm thinking, the woman is in her 70s. Her husband is already older than her, perhaps approaching 80, but he's saying, mm -mm. Those last two, that last one year. Eh? I, So, staying in it for 50 years does not necessarily mean you're ready. Keeping it for 40 years does not necessarily mean you're ready. Being married for 25 years is a great testimony, but that doesn't presuppose that you are ready or mature enough for it. Are you following what I'm saying? So, it's important for us to understand this. Anybody can enter something unready. I give an example, for example, of ministry. We've seen people who entered ministry unready. Moses is an example. Moses has this zeal to save Israel from the hand of the Pharaoh. And then in his anger, he smites an Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Then one person sees him, they report to the Pharaoh, and Moses flees into the wilderness. And the scriptures tell us, God never spoke to him in Midian for 40 years. He never heard the voice of God. Why? God is trying to tell Moses, you fixed it differently from the way I wanted to fix it. You did it in your own terms. And you know what? After 40 years, God appears to this man because purpose is wanting. He needs to redeem the Israelite. But in his spirit, in his soul, he's not a ready man. You can see the questions he asks God. If they ask me who has sent me, who should I tell them has sent me? Is that a man who has been working with God for 40 years? No. Will they believe me? Is that a man who knows God? Oh, but I stutter. I cannot talk. Is that a man who knows God? No. And so certain things are not dealt with this man, and he still has his anger. He's a hot-headed man. You see the journey. He's dealing with the children of Israel, but he has his anger issues. And eventually, because of anger, Moses never made it to the promised land. Why? Some of that stuff should have been dealt with before he started ministry. So even the conversation of preparing some of you for ministry, why do you think Jesus, for the first 30 years of his life, there was nothing accorded to ministry except sitting in the, in the what? In the synagogue sometime at 12 or so, arguing with the disciples over scripture. God is raising this man in wisdom and in stature. He wants him to mature. Remember, at the beginning of his coming, he stripped himself. The Bible says he came in the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of a man. Give me the amplified of that. He, he stripped himself of all privileges. Listen, and rightful word, dignity, as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men, was born like a human being. So when Jesus comes, he says, let me take away this whole thing, the anointing and everything. He stripped himself of every privilege and right as a son of God. And he began his life right. And he's telling you, this is the example. Regardless of where you begin from, you need that journey. You need the process. And God prepares him. And after he prepares him, now he's ready to work, to serve. And all of us have our journey of preparation. And that is why... It doesn't matter how early you start, you must be able to explain the process. I see some people rush some kids on the altar, and I'm like, hmm. If they knew better, they wouldn't have rushed that kid on the altar. It doesn't matter how gifted they are. Or if they did, they should be very calculating and conservative in introducing some people on the altar because they are not ready. They just don't know that they are not, but they are not ready. There are people you can look at and the gift would deceive that they're ready, but they're not ready. It's the same thing with marriage. You can have all the physical attributes. You know how to cook tick. You had work a tick. You're doing everything. Everything is ticking. And then you enter marriage. One month, two months, three months, four, five, and you realize you were not ready for what has come. Things start hitting you and you're like, eh? And then you start judging him, how are you, my uncle, my cousin, sister, and little brother. And you start throwing all these kinds of things. But you see, if we got this camera and looked at you specifically, in many cases, you were not ready for what you think you wanted. But hey, if a girl becomes 30, she gets the pressures. If a man becomes this, he gets the pressures. And that's just the way of life. So our responsibility as your priests 
is to help you understand. I know people who are married, and I know they are married, but I know they were not ready. And I would not give the opinion because by the time he came, you could not stop it. By the time she came, you could not stop it. They just need to also go through the process. Give it a year or two. They'll see that they were not ready to, to deal with some of these things. So it's important for us to prepare you. And if you're in marriage and you are not ready, some of you, this is going to be a preparation class. Some of you who are going to marry, oh, you might think I'm still young, I'm 19, I'm 15. Mama, days are going to rush and tomorrow I'll be on your wedding. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. So it's important for us to understand, are we ready? Were you ready when you entered it? Will you be ready when you enter it? And then what are you supposed to do to fix it? So he says, to us, marriage is not for everyone. And the verses below, verses 12, Jesus tells them, some from birth seemingly never give marriage a thought. He's giving us one class of people. There are people who naturally were not meant to get married. So, not every man is destined to marriage. Let's first, first understand that. Not every man is destined to marriage. And for those who are not made for it, we can say they are the luckiest or most blessed people according to scripture. Yes, Paul said, this is Paul's words. He says, I would rather, it's okay, you can give into marriage, but he says, but I would rather you stayed alone. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I would rather you what? Stayed alone for the sake of the kingdom. Let's read 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8. Read the message. I love the message version. Uh -huh. Let's read. I do though tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might be well the best thing for you as it is for me. He's telling them being single is the best. Now, disclaimer. For those who are not called to marriage, some of you are using that excuse, yet you are called to marriage. And then you say, but being single is better. Listen, that's only for people who were not called for marriage. There are people who are called for a celibate life. Being single is the best if you're a servant of God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a servant of God, it's the best thing that can ever happen to you. Because those who are married care for the things of the world. When you're single, you only care to please one person, God. But when you're married, you see, you please God and your husband. You please God and you understand. But as I say, he that is married cares for the things that are of the world and he that he may please his wife. But he that is unmarried, the Bible says, cares for the things of the Lord that he may please the Lord. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So it's, it's better. Paul says the troubles that come with marriage. He says sometimes it's better to say, uh-uh, let me live alone. But that is for those who were called there. You understand what I'm saying? You, you see? That's why the Bible says that if you are espoused to one person, do not pray that you be loosed. If you're bound, sorry, to a, a spouse, do not pray that you are, that you be loosed. And if you're loosed from a wife, seek not that you have a wife, meaning... For those of you who are not called to marry, don't pray, I wish I was married like Pastor Zach. Don't pray for it, please. It comes with a certain anointing and a certain place and grace and you don't have it, you'll crash. And for those of you who are married, don't pray to be what? Single. And sometimes you'll ask me the question, how do I know whether I'm called to be a celibate or not? Simple, your body. Your what? Your body. If your body doesn't feel some fire, maybe you are not called. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. It's a sign. People who are not called to marry, they, they don't, their bodies, yeah. But if your body becomes funny, Clear sign, don't even pray, oh God, take me, what? No, 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 no. Hallelujah. I just ask for self-control. Because some of you also, you just respond to your bodies anyhow. Which is also demonically, and in, uh, very, very demonic. You, everything your body wants, you give it. Eh, 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 eh. When you have the Holy Spirit, you must have self-control. Praise the Lord 
praise the Lord. You don't attend to every appetite and craving because it is there. Otherwise, some of you would go back drinking. Are you hearing me? So, your body will tell you. If it hasn't spoken, wait on God. Praise the Lord. So, he says, some, it seems as though they will never give it thought. Then he speaks about the others. He says, others never get asked or accepted. Some people, are, the thing is there, the, the call is there to get married, but they were never proposed to, or some of them were never accepted. Some of you, the wrong guys approach you. <laughs> Somebody has chased them. I fire with you also. Praise the Lord. So, you're the ones I came for who have shouted fire. Why aren't you accepted? Or why aren't you asked? Or why are you asked with the wrong, by the wrong people? You know, you know people like that. Every time somebody approaches them, the wrong person comes. Like one day, a lady sent me a message said, Apostle Grace, for me only married guys make a move. What's wrong with me? I told her, you, you look like you are. Yeah? Uh, the other thing a married man would look for, which is wrong. You see, you understand? So we went through a place of deliverance. Why should the married one look for you? The singles look away, and then a married man turns. Ah, ah, that's a bad spirit. Somebody shout fire. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Why should you be second hand? Why, why should you be the other option? Praise the Lord. And some, he says, there are those who decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. Now, that's a high level of consecration. It's not for the canon. Remember a canon, and they say, me, I'm for the kingdom. But then when you look at them, they don't even understand God. In the spirit realm, if they cross the road, the car would knock them in the spirit. <laughs> if you, that's the simplest way I can give the example. But then they're saying, ah, you know, me, I'm for the kingdom. <clears throat> you must understand that's a higher level of consecration. When Paul says, I'm for this, you can see why he says he's celibate. Somebody shout hallelujah. But he says, but if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. Do it. So, what, 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 is, what are the key facts here? That marriage requires a certain place of maturity. That does not presuppose that those who are not married are immature. Uh uh. No, 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 no. Some of you say, ah, that person is immature. She, she can't even marry. No, 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 no. We don't gauge maturity based on one degree. And it's also not true that if somebody is not married in this life, they cannot live a full life. No. Your completeness is in God. The Bible says, ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality. Stop this pressure that the world gives you that because you are not married, therefore you're not complete. Get it out of your head. Because having Christ is the completion of all completion you'll ever need. With or without a husband, with or without a wife, you are fine. Hallelujah. So stop putting yourself on unnecessary what? Pressure. Somebody shout hallelujah. But the key facts here again are God requires a certain aptitude, a certain inherent um, ability, inability to be able to handle marriage. And he says he requires a certain maturity for you to be married and live a married life. He requires a certain grace for you to live a certain life. And so there are fundamental keys to help us judge whether you are mature for marriage or whether you were mature when you entered marriage or in your marriage of 15 years or 20 years or 30, you are actually mature to live the life of marriage. I'm going to give you five. They are not only five, they're probably eight or nine, as I know, but they are five fundamental ones. And each one of these that I'm going to share, one day I might require, someday in the future, to give you almost an hour and a, half and a half on each of these ones because I cannot share them in just five minutes, ten minutes that I'm given to share every point. Uh -uh. They are deep and I'll, over time I'll give you time to really go deep into them and dig deeper for us to have the understanding. But today I must give you the overview for the standard, for you to weigh yourself against these things and God to help you understand whether you were ready and mature enough to handle marriage or not. There are five fundamental keys. Are you ready? Number one, it's called the law of priority. The law of priority. Human beings are naturally born selfish people. 
You can see how your children behave when they're young. You behave the same when you were young. Every toy was yours. Every mobile phone was yours. The chair was yours. You understand? I've seen kids fighting for space that they find you sitting in a space and they feel they deserve it more than you do. We've seen all that, you see? Because human beings are born what? Selfish. But as you, turn, you, 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 you start to grow, you are taught the way of, you know, sharing and, 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 you know, being a part of a larger community, family, and life. You go to school and sit next to a child of a different tribe. They're educating your mind to learn to live beyond yourself, okay? And because of that selfish character, many of us give ourselves first priority. So everything in the world works best if it's first working for me. Priority. Now, when you get married, or if you're planning to get married, one of the things you forget is you first. You learn to put your spouse first. If you are not ready to put another person first, you're not ready for marriage. If you are in marriage, but you are not able to put your spouse first, you are not yet ready for marriage. Whether you're 15 years married or 20 years or 30 years, priority means that above all things, your spouse should never feel that they are less of anybody else in your life. Your spouse should feel that they are valued above anybody else. Your spouse must feel that he or she comes first. We have had experiences. Oh, what, I, need, I need to buy this. And somebody tells you, you know, I cannot buy this because my mother needs this. Why didn't you stay with your mother? Why didn't you stay with your mother? The Bible says, for this cause a man shall leave his mother and father. I'm not saying don't look after your parents. No, but my wife comes first before anyone. You understand what I'm saying? They must come first. If you're not willing to give somebody first place in your life, you're lying to yourself. It won't work. It will not work. And this goes into our relationships, our emotions, our intimacy and everything. Your spouse should come first. To be ready for marriage means you're willing to consider somebody. If you have one bun and it's what's left in the world, it's what you are able to share. You're willing to give it over for the other, especially for men. Because we are the leaders of our households. Somebody shout hallelujah. You must as a woman know that of everybody in the world, my wife, my husband comes first. You understand? Whether it's giving my wife or husband must be provided first. I know people who treat the world outside so good and treat their homes so badly in every aspect. And let me tell you, even opinions, do you know that a man can sit with his wife in the house and talk about something and she gives an opinion and then he goes out in a bar and comes back with the opinion of the bar above his wife? And it works the other way too. That you'd rather get the opinion outside. Everyone outside is right than your husband. If he gives an opinion, his opinion is not as important as the friend you had lunch with. That's selfish. That's selfish. There's a lady I was dealing with. She's of course not from this church, but she's a friend of mine. She said, I've been married to close to 35 years. And my husband is a billionaire in shillings and a millionaire in dollars. But apostle, many times I leave my house without fuel. And we are not quarreling. It's not that we are, we are quarreling. No, we are friends. We even woke up happy. But I tell him I need fuel. And he says, I don't have money. I don't have money. But he's a billionaire. He has money to buy a car. He has money to improve his clothes. He has money to build, to buy houses. He's buying. I see him purchase things. When it comes to me, I, he can't give me money for fuel. He says, I don't have money. 
So how can you say you don't have money and after one month you've bought a Range Rover? W what is that? Priority. When it comes to you, the money comes. When it comes to your spouse, the money is not there. I don't care whether you're 30 years married. You're not happy. You're not ready. You're immature. And interestingly, those people, I know them. When they're on parties, they're like this. Hello, they're smiling and you're like... Hmm. But me, I know the truth. <laughs> I'm here, me, but I'm quiet. But I know the truth. Uh, that woman ain't happy. She ain't happy. You understand what I'm saying? So you are so good outside. But inside, you're not. You're not. I was telling uh, the first service a story, I know. We had a neighbor. This guy was very tough. Very tough to his kids. So one time, one of his boys messed up, and then he tied him up the tree, upside down, and beat him. For writing a love letter to a girl, he beat him almost to kill him. But he used to buy those other things, video games, what? But at home, he was a tough cookie. You know those tough men? Eh? So we used to even sometimes go to their home to play video games with them. And then you have this kid who comes from without and says, eh, you guys, eh, you have a good daddy. I wish my daddy was yours. <laughs> now, us who knew the guy, we're like, <laughs> you don't know what you're asking for. And, and, and you know such men, eh, they are so good, eh? even to the children, to the neighbor's children. Hello. <laughs> you know those guys, eh? They are so good to the neighbor's children. They are so good to everyone. And then people say, hey, you guys have a good dad. You guys have a good man. <laughs> but at home, your ear is pulled to the North Pole and back. <laughs> but when they go out, happy family. And then they close the door. And the guy turns the leg. Don't laugh with me. Praise the Lord Jesus. Did you know that the root word for holiness, the root word from there, the word, the word holiness is derived, is a word called being one. And do you know what it means to be one? That the life you live outside is reconciled with the life you live inside. That's holiness. My wife should be able to see that I'm the same man home as the same man is to the church. Because if, if I, I love, show you love, but I don't love her. If I show you compassion, but I cannot show her compassion, then it's questioned of my holiness. Holiness is not just your moral standing because the foundation of that moral standing is character. And the essence of that character is the place where you are reconciled to truth. Somebody shout hallelujah. Never forget that. Never forget that. So back to the issue. Marriage, living a married life will teach you to live selfless or above all, to consider one before you. How is she feeling before I fail? How is he feeling before I feel? If you're not ready to come out of your selfish zone, don't waste your time and money. Don't go to the wedding meetings and plan for cakes. You're wasting your time because marriage has to teach you. You see what I'm saying? And that is why I pity for people who are in marriages with selfish people. It's a hard life to keep up with a man or a woman that considers themselves before they consider anyone else. Life, as you continue to grow, will come with all of these responsibilities that will warrant you to know that you are supposed to live beyond yourself. And you cannot live married. You can't keep there. You will count losses and there will be compromises as much as some will be healthy and some unhealthy because you need to consider another fast before you. If you're not ready for that, don't waste your time. Or if you are in there and you're married, but you're dealing with that, then you must grow up. Your spouse is not called. They are chosen. 
So he or she is not among the many. He or she is the one. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rest are simply ones, but this one is the one. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So don't live selfish. Secondly, the principle is the law of companionship. The law of companionship. The message Bible says in Genesis 2.18, it said, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a what? A helper. And what is the other word he added? Companion. Company. You saying that I'm ready for marriage, you saying that I'm married, means that you must understand how the law of companionship works. Companionship in our intimate places, companionship in our dream and vision places, companionship in our recreational spaces. I call it recreational companionship as well. What is recreational companionship? That your spouse is actually your best company and fun. Companionship is the power or the art of learning to live with someone under all circumstances. To know how to live with them, not just keep up with them, not just tolerate them, but to live with people. Because when you're living single, many of you, you will notice, you start to build a single life. My bed, my bathroom, my soap, my toothpaste. Yeah? You, you've heard of one time I was dealing with a couple, they were, they were having toothpaste battles. He doesn't even have order in how he presses the toothpaste. Mbu, you're supposed to begin from down going up. Mbu, the guy presses it in the middle. And that one is disturbing. <laughs> so, do you know that it takes a certain art, a certain patience, a certain maturity to learn to live with the same person every day? That's the separation between marriage and dating because you, you can't never connect dating to marriage. Those are two different things. That's why me personally, I don't believe in dating personally, but you can date. It's okay. But me, I don't believe in that. No. Because you are, you are building a relationship around dates. Eh? Let's meet on Tuesday. And then you put a reminder, quickie, quickie, quickie. You finish working. Then you go out, exchange pleasantries, speak sweet nothings, deceive each other. Oh, I missed you. What? Oh, high five. What? And then you walk out together and everyone is watching you and they say, these guys, I think they're going somewhere. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Ask us who are married. It's different. It's different. Because here, we are meeting and the setting is, it's, it's one calculated, two it's constructed. Yeah, when you're dating, there's a way you dress, isn't it? There's a way you, there's a way you, huh? you understand? You're going for a date, really. You bypass people and they hmm, where are you going? You understand? Then you put on that car dress of yours and then people say, hey, she's going for what? For a date. Marriage that it, it it marriage disintegrates those constructs and yeah you get to know how when the hair is this side you understand him when he has just woken up you understand it changes the narrative oh so some of you have lived with debts you just know how to live with debts you don't know how to live with them when they're in the house. Some of you read the news in horror in COVID season when they were showing on the newspapers. They said, oh, the rates of, 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 of what? Of, of battering women have increased. Eh? Eh, crimes of passion. You know, couples were killing each other. You saw on television. Man hacks wife. Woman cuts off husband's hand. Simanya, uh, um, man burns woman's feet. Those are the news that were in COVID season. You understand? Man and woman at police. Eh? Those of you who watch Bukhet Day. 
he beat me. Even last week, he beat me. Why? A man just woke up one side and told you, stay home. Nyamaza. <laughs> When we're in the bush, <laughs> you are hiding. You know, some of us had never heard him talk. <laughs> you sit there and they are talking. You understand? We had never, many of us, but to sit on a president, what? But COVID took us home. Whether you wanted to watch or you didn't, this time you got to listen to wisdom. Bazukuru, stay home. Now, <laughs> so, but remember, there were married people who were dating, but they didn't know. Why? <laughs> because the guy comes back in the evening, bathes, has tea, eats food, does his stuff, sleeps, wakes up, goes. One year, two years, children are growing, safari. What? I'm in Nairobi. I'm back. So they are living like that. And you think they're happily married. Now, the man locks you down. And you're not going anywhere. And somebody looks at their spouse. Eh? And they discover, by the way, your teeth are long. Your what? Your... <laughs> Companion! Now they have to learn to live together. Leave me alone. Even you, your foot is long. Uh, poo, poo, poo. They start. Some of you, COVID taught you to live together. Some of you, COVID showed you you can't. And then people are saying after COVID you hear divorces, but they began when you were locked down. Because that day, you had to really understand each other. Were you even friends? You weren't. And then as soon as people discovered that some people are not really hard workers. They just didn't want to come back home early. And then you hear guys saying, hey, when are they releasing us? But this, this guy, uh, uh, he need to release us. But the guy in his head is saying, I need to run away from this woman. <laughs> the art of learning to live with somebody. One, it begins with being ready to make an, have an unconditional friendship. Those of you who want to learn this, you must learn to build an unconditional friendship. Your spouse, because they are fast, find a way for them to be your best friend. Find a way for them to be your best friend. Or if you say, I'm going to get married, or you're married right now, some of you, you're very good lovers, but you're the worst friends. You find yourselves confiding in other people than anyone else. That's a problem. You hear man, and all his plans are outside his house. He just informs his wife later, oh, by the way, I did this. Are you friends? Do you even discuss about these things? You don't know how to live together. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know how to share space. You, you, you sit there. I mean, I don't want to sit with you. You understand? Married people, they love each other. But they can't even sit together. They can't. They can't even laugh together. It's not there. And then some say, oh, you know, you're just saying that because you're married on one year. But when you grow, it grows still. You get used. No. And I tell people, nothing you continuously invest in can grow still. It does not work that way. Why? Because the principle is seed and harvest. Whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. If you continue sowing the right seeds in your marriage, it will never grow still. It will never grow still. I've never been there with my wife and we have nothing to say. We always have, there's always something. There's always something for us to talk about. There's always something. We, we can't even be quiet because there's always something to talk about and laugh about. There's always something because you invest, you learn to sow the right seed. 
You see, and sometimes it begins in those little small things when you're communicating with each other. You see what I'm saying? If you show them that they can talk to you, they will talk. If you show them that they cannot talk to you, they will sulk. They will not talk. If you think that their opinions are important, they will give them. If you don't think that their opinions are not important, they will not give them. It's what you what? You sow. Somebody shout hallelujah. If somebody feels that they are hard, they will speak again. If somebody feels that they are not hard, they will not speak again. It's what we invest. You see, and that companionship then becomes a lifetime of learning to invest in each other. Learn to be together and it's okay to be two. That space should be okay. Some of you, you're, you're only connected because of the children. Some of you are connected because of you. Uh, because of, you understand, there are many other things connecting you to this because of the church. Because, but are you really connected? If, if all this was not there, would you still be two? You see what I'm saying? That is why for me, when couples get married, I prefer those first, that first year, you live together. That first one or two years. I would recommend, if even possible, don't have a house boy or a house girl. Mm -mm. Don't put them in your space. Unless it's unavoidable. Some of you uh, have responsibilities. You are living with your brothers and sisters, which is also a virtue. It's a gift. It's good by God. But if you can, learn at least to spend that first year or two to, to figure things out and understand each other. Says that you're not strange to each other. You see what I'm saying? Otherwise, you'll find the woman talking more with the house girl than the kids. Ah! This guy is in the TV. Somebody shout companionship. Man was not made to be alone. We were created to learn to live with another being if you were called for this. So mature, mature into living with an individual. Sometimes your bed is if you have lived alone, even the way you cover yourself, you just wake up and your, your duvet is gone. It's my duvet. Not me. Mm. <laughs> me, mine doesn't go away. You understand what I'm saying? You don't see it. Look, where my, where's my blanket? You understand? But you learn. It's okay. It's okay. You understand what I'm saying? It's what? It's okay. And some of the things that were your comfort and space, they are going to be taken, and that's okay. The thing you loved most, sometimes you'll see it crossing, and you're like, this thing was mine. How come now it's... Yeah? Unfortunately, some of us, we can't cross things. The way God... Uh, you understand what I'm saying? You buy your T-shirt, and the next day you see it moving. <laughs> yeah, but it's my shirt. But you can't cross a blouse. You can't cross a skirt. <laughs> but your shirt crosses. And your watches cross. Me. I smell my perfume and I'm like, what? What does my, what's my perfume doing here? You understand? But it's okay. Because you've learned to live with someone. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's okay. It's okay. It's called what? companionship number one three the law of acceptance one time i was sharing with somebody and i said the challenge with some believers especially women they have a list of people who don't exist that's why some of you are not married because your list doesn't exist the things you expect in a man they don't exist in one man. That's your only problem. You'd be married long ago, but you have a what? A list. But with God, all things are possible. He'll give me my heart's desires. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not saying that he will not give your heart's desires or all things are possible. But what if some of these, tick, these things you tick are going to become a process? And you're not comfortable with the process. You just want it to come as a finished product. Keep waiting. You'll wake up when you're 60. 
the law of acceptation teaches you firstly that if you're going to enter marriage i tell people there are two things here there is your opinion about the kind of spouse you have and the or need and there is god's opinion on the kind of spouse you should have did you know sometimes you should know what really matters because the law of acceptation is easier when you have taken the will of God in context. For example, firstly, is this person from God? One, they must be born again. Are they born again? Yes. Now, two, are they from, I mean, that's of course, if they are from God, you can't unequal a yoke. So no compromise there. This is not for you to accept non-believers. Eh? Some of you might use that scripture. But he, he, I believe you'll get born again. To vehicle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, but some of you, God can show you somebody and tell them, look, this is who they are. On my six or seven boxes, as a woman, maybe the, the three tick, the other four not. That's not what's important. What's important? Did God say she's the one? Because I see people mixing two things. Did God say he's the one? If God said he's the one, then let God fix the other four. You understand what I'm saying? In there, you learn to accept the person God has given you and allow God to deal with them I've seen people walk out of marriage in two weeks. Mm -mm. Apostle? <laughs> and some even add, even if it was you. Don't put me in your store. I'm not you. I, I can't be you. I'm not you. I can't divorce in two weeks. I've been married for 70 years. That's proof. <laughs> but why do people laugh when I say that? You, Because it's true. That's why you laugh. Are you following what I'm saying? Acceptation means that they might not tick all the boxes, but because God has given me that woman, I must accept her firstly in her advantages and disadvantages, in her strengths and flaws. And to also accept that some of these flaws are not going to go tomorrow morning. They need a journey of patience of one year, two years, three years. But I should be mature enough to wait when God is dealing with him or her. Because not all get it the first day. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's very important for you to understand. Acceptation is key. You must be willing to accept the person God has given you. With every mistake you will see and the things that don't mark right, be patient. Because one, it means you acknowledge that you were not called to change that person, but you believe in the God who gave you that person, that he's also able to change them. But number two also, I've seen that many times, people who are hard to accept others usually have not pointed the finger to themselves to examine who they really are. Because if you had a chance to look at yourself, mister, you'd reconsider. Yes, yes, you're putting up with too much, but she's also putting up with too much. So, okay, I'm married. Can I be patient with God to change him? Can I be patient with God to change her? Can I accept the things I cannot change and commit them to God and leave them with God and live my life happy and work with those that are working while I wait for God to fix it? Or I'm just going to turn my eyes on what's not working and kill everything that works until my marriage dies. But also the downside to this is I have also seen Relationships where some people have been in a place where somebody has accepted you and been patient with you and because of that acceptation, some of you use it as a tool to further become wicked or indifferent and not want to change it because people are accepting you for who you are. Yet you know that that which you're dealing with in that narrative is wrong. God will judge you. You reap what you sow. Don't do it. That's called abuse. That's emotional abuse. And some of us even go further and justify those things. 
you knew that when you married me as a quarrelsome person, take me as I am, I'll always be quarrelsome. Man of God, did you hear what you just said? That means you're telling her you're not willing to even change or try. You're telling him you're not willing to change. That's what actually really breaks people. Not the patience or acceptation of who you are, but the fact that you are justifying that patience and acceptation to never change and become a better husband or wife. That is so painful. I've sat down, I've cancelled people. That is so painful. God has no problem with a person who is trying to walk out of something, who is trying to be better, and you can show the fruit in accordance to your repentance. But there's a problem that because somebody is patient with you, therefore you further abuse and extend the boundary of your abuse. You extend your power and even hurt her or hurt him the more because he or she is patient with you. That is very dangerous. And I've seen some even die. I've seen some even die. Not because of their weakness, but because they're not willing to acknowledge that it is weak and that they need help. You understand what I'm saying? Notwithstanding, if they do, that's their problem. Keep your part of the bargain and stay accepting to them. If you're not ready to accept somebody. I've had people divorce people for small very small things. <coughs> Very small things. You say, what? No, 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 no. I can't keep up with, you know. And you say, what? Those are very small things. Those are things even God keeps up with you. But you're not willing to extend that same grace to another what? Another person. Sometimes when you look at yourself most, you'll humble more. You'll humble more. But again, it's selfish because you are taking and never giving. And I'll teach that thing once deeply because there are people who live in relationships where people just take but they never live to give anything. When you're talking about taking and giving, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about many aspects of life. Because marriage is supposed to be a place where you take but you also learn to give. And some things have got to give. Sometimes you're going to lose certain um, comforts because you need to give over. That's selfless. Selfless. Sometimes you're going to also sacrifice the things you love because you need to give. But there are people who are just taking, 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 taking. When you go to the place of giving, they don't give anything back. If you're that kind of person, it won't. You'll struggle through. You'll struggle through. Somebody shout hallelujah. Which number are we on now? Four. Number four, individual responsibility. Individual responsibility. That there is that God-given responsibility God has given me as a man. There is that God-given responsibility that God has given you as a woman or wife. Our individual roles. For example, as a man, I was called to look after my family. That's my primary responsibility. My wife should not lack, my children should not lack. Oh, so what if my wife makes $20 million and I make $10,000? It doesn't matter. My primary responsibility is to make sure that I look after my family. Now, we are dealing with a generation, especially the younger generation, I was telling my auntie recently, the younger generation doesn't want to work. Our generation? Now, because I, am, I come from the other side of the tracks, my first job I did at the age of 13, that I was first hired at, at my first job at the age of 13. I've worked all my life for as long as I can remember. I'm a pastor who also does business now. I'm a hard worker. I don't understand, especially, I can understand for a woman because we, we were made to look after you. But I don't understand a young man who doesn't want to work. It's only in the faith where you find a guy, eh? Who is tongue speaking born again? Buhises. You know, and one day I'll teach about it. The Jews always use the example. We are sons of Abraham. They always used it a lot. Not in one instance, not in two instances. They always gave excuses with their inefficiencies in life. But every time they would, they would say, we are children of Abraham. Meaning that we are people of faith. Some of you, you claim so much faith that you start to look stupid with it. I'll give you an example. No, let's talk about it. 
a guy is going to marry, get married, sorry. Does he have a job? No. Does he have money for rent? No. Does he have food in the house? No. Did he buy his marriage suit? No. Did he buy the rings of the wife? No. Did he pay for the cake? No. Did he pay for the venue? No. Did he pay for anything? Ah, no, guys. I'm believing God. <laughs> Honeymoon. Nothing. Then you ask the guy, after marriage, where are you going to live? Proverbs 24 verses 27. Let's read. One, two, three, let's go. Put first things first. Uh-huh. Prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field. And afterward, build your house and establish a home. Which comes first? The field. But I'm believing God. You are not believing God. You are sick. You are sick here. Then you look at the dear girl and say, now, ha. Ha. And the guy wakes up in the morning, eh? And the woman goes to work, eh? And he sits on TV. On her money. When you're a man, you feel it. At least get up, eh? And just go out and sweep the compound. But a guy wakes up, eh? and some of them, the girls work, and the guy doesn't work. You understand? So the guy just sits on TV the whole day. I don't have a job. You don't have a job. When you have legs and hands, brother, brother, at least wake up at six and go out and stand on the road. That's what a man is. But we have a group of gentlemen, young men who don't have muscle. If a thief broke into the house, they would hide behind their wife. <laughs> Hurry up! And then after that, they, they say, when the thief's broke in, I tried to protect my wife. <laughs> you coward. Praise the Lord. No, no. It is our, hey, even if you leave this church, it will find you wherever you will go. This is life. Somebody can say, ah, pastor's abused me, I wrote, I'm not going to return. I swear you return. Because I am speaking in love, I know what it means. And some of you, your father can't talk to you, your mother can't talk to you, but Apostle Grace can. Because you fear God. Somebody shout hallelujah. It is your God-given role and responsibility to find, and it doesn't matter. Listen, and let me tell you, with women, it's not how much you make. By the way, some people think, oh, you, you can't marry a woman with more money, she'll do this to you. You have not understood women yet. A woman cannot disrespect you because she makes more money. Women usually begin disrespecting when they see that they don't see a vision in you. That's their problem. And not that they should. Acceptance. Don't use it to disrespect your husband. Those ones, the ones I'm talking about are not here. They are not in Fanero. But what I'm trying to tell you, God has called you as a vision bearer of your house. Even when money is not there, please give a solution. If you cannot give a solution, please sell hope. Because these women marry us for hope. If you say hey, we are stuck, we don't have anything, what do we do? You tell her, don't worry, things are going to be okay. At least you convince her that uh, we are breaking through soon. Something is coming. Stay positive. But then you see this guy go to the woman saying, now, my wife, uh, I don't know what we are going to do. What do you want her to do? You're the head. If the head doesn't know what to do, what do you want her to do? At least, at least say something out of your head and say, mm, things are not yet working, but uh, I see something is coming. Oh, she'll say, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let me sell my shoes, let's go. Because, I, listen, women marry, women marry 
vision. They don't care how much you have. They don't even care where you've begun from. But tell her that in five years we shall be okay. I'll get you the best you need. I have a dream for our future. I have a plan. It's not yet there. But I feel in my spirit that something is going to work. She will follow you. But start that, yes, but start that conversation of, hmm. I don't know. Then she says, don't worry, I have some money. But <laughs> she has one, one to zero. Don't worry, I, I'll send something. Then she sees she's thinking for the family. And then the beginning of time comes. And you see, I'm sorry, I'm going to use a hard word. You see this frog doesn't care. <laughs> it doesn't care. You will come back. You won't leave the church, I know. How can you not care that your child needs to go to school? How? At least ask, how much do we need? Even if you don't have money. And tell your wife, you know what, eh? I got 20K. These kids must go to school. May the Lord provide for us. Even if she puts 90% of the money, but put that 20 can tell her, I'm a man, I'm a hard worker, things are not just not yet adjusting, but when time comes, I will change. Or at least if she pays fees, buy the shoes, and tell her, darling, things are not yet okay, but I can shop. Can I shop? That's a man. But when time begins, I don't have money. Then in the middle of the term, he buys a Range Rover. And it's also I like that we have frogesses. <laughs> if that word doesn't exist, I've created it. Tell, tell the dictionary guys to update their dictionaries. Because there must be a froges. We also have an indifferent kind of people. Because as a woman, you also have a God-given role. For example, there's a reason why I don't have breasts. There's a reason. Meaning there are things I can never do for that child. I can love my child, I can provide, but there are things I can't do. They are given to you. The Bible says women must be homekeepers. Doesn't the Bible say so? Women must be what? He, home keepers. Keepers of homes. Do you know what that means? That when you get married, your primary responsibility as a woman is to keep your home. To be discreet, Titus 2.5, chest, keepers of home. You have guests and she knows she has guests and her heart can tell her, let me clean this, let me remove this. That's not a man's responsibility. A man can do it. I always tell people, there are those good men who can wash a cup. There are those good men who sometimes when you go, you, you, you wake up and he has made breakfast. Oh, he made breakfast. <laughs> but it's not his primary responsibility. What does Proverbs 31 say? She rises up early Listen to English. She rises up early before dawn, preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. Who? She. Hey, is it wrong for men to do it? If they do it, it's a privilege, not a primary responsibility. Do you know, do you know the power? By the way, let me talk to my daughters now. Do you know the power? of a man waking up to something you've cooked every morning. Do you know how much power that is? You think the woman in Proverbs was stupid? Do you know what it's like for a man every morning to wake up on another woman's hands? To feed on another woman's hands? But my secretary will cook. Mwe? It's important for him to eat 
what your hands have prepared. Doesn't matter how small. But then you find a girl, but she started for, I can't cook. You can't cook. You can't cook. You, and then you say, you're getting married this year, and she even falls. Uh-uh, that is not marriage anointing. It's trying to deliver you. That one is teaching you to cook. If you fell under that power, it was teaching you to cook. It wasn't teaching you to keep a man. No, that's not marriage. Uh -uh. Era, if you fall under that power, you don't know how to cook. Just now I released the power on you to learn to cook. Put first things. Yeah. Okay, he has come back and you know probably he's the kind who throws his socks everywhere. I'm not that man. I don't throw socks everywhere. My wife didn't pick them. I don't. That's not my that's not me. But let's just say the guy came and threw socks there. Homekeeper. Pick those socks. Take them where they're supposed to go. But then you find a which kind of man are you cutting these socks? Who are you leaving them for? Hey, you're not my mother. Hey, 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 hey. Listen, you're not his mother. You're his wife. Helper, suitable. Just pick those socks and take them where they're supposed to be. That's not his primary responsibility. I know this is not popular in nations like Europe and what. That's why they're getting more divorce rates than Africa. So we are the ones to teach them marriage, not them to teach us. And that is the truth. We keep our wives. I know an American, some Americans might debate this. That's why divorce rates are high there. No offense if you're an American. We're the ones to teach them. You're a hell keeper. Keep your room, keep your house. You understand? But then a man enters home. Your bag is there, the key is there. You understand? Everything is... It's my responsibility to remove the, those things. No, it's your responsibility. Let me look, do the hard stuff. Let me look for fees. Like, like, it's, like it's my responsibility to make sure you eat. It's your responsibility to make sure that you keep your house clean. Every dirty house speaks of a woman's unhygiene nature, not a man. It's like every stupid child shames you as a woman, not a man. In Proverbs, if a child is stupid, she's only stupid because you're stupid. That's what the Bible says. If a child is wise, she's only wise because her father is. Read Proverbs 10 verses 1. A wise son maketh a glad father, and a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. That means your children are as wise as you are. That is not, some people say, Ikari, that's unfair. No, it's not unfair. If you saw it from the right light, it's actually power. It's power to know that you have power over your child. And when you understand that, you take responsibility and make that child smart. You make them smart. If you don't know how, we will teach you how to raise smart children. But our children will not fail in class. Our children will not fail in life. Mothers who are here, put your hand on your belly and say nothing that comes out of this womb can be foolish in Jesus' name because I'm a woman of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Understand your responsibility and do it well for a woman. And there are even deeper things. I'll teach about that thing deeper. There are deeper, deeper things. For example, her husband is known in the courts. Why does the Bible say her husband? Do you know the power you have in making a man? Do you know how much power God has given you in making? Some of you don't even know how to make men great. You don't know, but you're a helper. What are you helping? What are you helping? Cooking, I can get a house girl. Washing machine, I can get one. But what are you helping? When the Bible says her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders, there's something about you that makes me great among those who are great. And you must know that wisdom. It's your responsibility. Oh, don't I have a part? I do have a part, but you have one too. You have one too. You understand what I'm saying? Like there are also responsibilities as a leader, as a vision bearer in my house, are over me in how my wife should be. Not that I impose them on her, but that there's something I must do for her to become that. You see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? She has to know how to talk because I, that speech is me. That's my vision. This is the head. You see? He's the head. 
eyes, how they hear, how they speak. All of that is part of my responsibility. There are things my wife can't say because of how I speak. You see, there are things she cannot do because of the way she knows I see. She understands my vision. And I cast that vision on her life. Like I said, how can you be married and you don't have a vision? Your wife asks you, where are we going the next five years? Um, you tell me. <laughs> Mommy, you tell me. <laughs> some boys, some boys are not serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm hard on some of you because some of us, we are not serious and we are asking ourselves why these women are disturbed. How can you tell a woman, you tell me where we are going? That's false humility. You're supposed to know where you're going. Yeah. You tell her, oh, this is what I say, five years, we should be having a billion shillings on the account. We should be having a house somewhere in Kololo. Uh, I know the dream car you should drive. How? I don't know, but I know that I know that I know that I know because I'm a vision bearer. She wants something she can build on. They don't ask us because they don't know. They ask us because they are submitted. Remember, the power of submission is adaptation. Ephesians tells us, wife, submit to your husbands. Amplified says submissive and adaptive adapt yourselves so what can she and i'll teach about that deeply to understand how to adapt what can she adapt to if she does not have the vision of a thing what do you want her to adapt herself to she must understand where you're going somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. shout amen. amen romans 14 verses 12 says every one of us shall give account of himself to god it's very important you have an accountability to god concerning the roles he gave you I know that we're living in a generation where our worlds are shifting. I mean, responsibilities are shifting. But let us go back to the biblical responsibility. For example, in India, women, I think, marry men. You see what I'm saying? It's okay. But if you're an Indian and you're a Christian man, switch that role and be a man in your house. Switch it. It can be cultural, and that's all right. But you have to go back biblically. Our responsibilities are very clear. Of course, even us would have, you know, you know, keep being married because I mean, things come into you. It's all right. One time I thought about it and I said, now imagine me, I was an Indian, and then my wife was marrying me, and then I can accept that proposal or not. And then they bring things <laughs> at my family. Then I'm saying bye to my mother. Yeah. It's, <laughs> It's a, it's a nice movie. <laughs> no offense, my Indian friends. But if you're Christian, you must understand how God has accorded these responsibilities. You are supposed to care for your house. Very, very important. Praise the Lord. Like you, women, are supposed to fulfill your responsibilities in the home. Praise the Lord. Lastly, service. Marriage is ministry and it's service toward God. And that service that begins firstly to your spouse, your children, because your family is your first ministry and then has to cross out of your family. Because if your marriage at the end of the day cannot expand the kingdom or add anything to the kingdom of God, you're wasting our time. Somebody shout hallelujah. Galatians 5.13, your brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Begins with me understanding I'm just not doing my wife a favor. I am ministering to her. And then I minister to my children. And then I minister to the church. And then I minister to the world. And my marriage becomes a blessing to the kingdom. Because it's the vision of Christ and the church, the great mystery. Christ and the church, that union is the power that changes the world. Your marriage must live beyond you and you having children to extend your family lineage. But as a couple, have you even sat down to say, what as a couple are we doing to build the kingdom, to build each other? How do I build you? How do you build me? How do we add to our children? Because this liberty came with a responsibility. And how then does that extend for us to become a blessing to the kingdom of God? If you can do that, 
then you are ready and mature for marriage. Somebody shout hallelujah. Get to your feet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you have been offended in this service, believe me, your life has been saved. Because it means you have understood the truth. And better this than lose your marriage. Better this than lose your responsibility before God. Better this than fail your children and put reproach on your life. And honestly, some things many of us know, but some of us don't. Some of us don't. And I want in a special way to celebrate the men in this room who have been there for their wives and children. Because fathers are very, very scarce lately. And celebrate the women that are doing their part. Because emancipation has spoiled the narrative. But I ask us, let's keep what the word says. Let's not build our marriages based on wild opinions. No, let's do what the word says. It's the only way marriages will heal. And people will see us happy and they will believe on our God. Praise God. So, I pray for every man and woman at the sound of my voice. If you are not yet married, tonight God has blessed the antidote, the pill, the right injection to cure of any difference in this matter. And I believe that that seed that has been planted will make you the best husband, the best wife this world has ever seen. If you're married and you've had these points and have made your errors, the word is there not only to entertain us, but the Bible says it is profitable to rebuke us. But we love God enough to take it. It is profitable to correct us. It is profitable to inspire us until we are furnished in all good things. And that in whatever you have seen inadequate, don't judge yourself. We just ask God to help you. Just ask God to help you. And I pray that tonight, may the seed that has been planted tonight heal every part that is broken and wanting in your marriage. Some of you, it's, you're here on behalf of your spouse who cannot be here now. But I pray that may this seed that has entered you cross into them also in the name of Jesus. And then there's, there's a sad group of people who have gone through breakups and divorces Ah, some were you're doing, but some of you it wasn't you're doing. This is my heart's prayer. May you find love again. May God give you another chance, another opportunity to build it right in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody said, Amen. If you're sick in your body, I speak healing. If you're struggling in any way, I speak deliverance. I decree that you're going to have a wonderful week this week, a wonderful month, a wonderful year. You are a success, you are blessed, you are progressing. Nothing will hold you back in Jesus' name, amen. If you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now to come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. My spirit tells me that you are ready. Just walk here right now and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you say, I want to be born again, come and stand here with me. I want to pray with you, come, come. The mystery revealed through love and sacrifice Not of my own, but of her son He came to me come in peace and held me in his arms And said to me, I found true love and said today, I found true love. Come, 
ask your neighbor if they're not born again, encourage them. Come. So it has been since then of my father's child when I received his son he me down on his feet is not where I am found to be but on the seat right by his side but on the seat right by his side come oh you who are here you're just going to speak the words I'm going to speak from your heart you say Lord Jesus I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory I believe that you are here for me and that you're going to change my life today I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. May God bless you. May he heal you. May he deliver you. May he transform your lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Apostle Emma, I want you to give this man a few minutes. Eh? Give him a few minutes. Eh? Yeah, I feel the language is also a challenge you get an IED plan minister to him. So you're going to go with these people just for a few minutes. What just want to write your names, your phone numbers, know where you come from, teach you how, what it means to be born again, follow you up and make sure that you're standing. I'll see you very soon in Jesus' name. And keep coming for the second service. This service is yours. I'm sorry I've gone past time, but did you forgive me today? Praise God. All right, carry somebody on Thursday. Please do it. Tell your neighbor, carry somebody on Thursday. Who is going to do it? May God give you grace. And may you share in the blessing that happens on my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. Amen. All right. See you. Hey, hey. Of the Holy Ghost. Hope this me. broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals and timely updates. The Fenero app available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at fenero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Fenero, make manifest.